there's definitely a um, proclivity, I'd say, for for gamblers to get into Bitcoin and investing. You know, whether they do it for gambling or not is is another story. But I mean, you've been in the the gambling space for for how many years? Yeah, long time. Long time, long time. And um, so, I mean, so tell me a little bit about this. You know, I know you were, I mean, you were retired, uh, yeah. what, 12 years ago. You were retired in, in 2006. What, what were you doing? I was living in Asia, actually just enjoying myself. Okay. I was living in Thailand, the Philippines, Vietnam, traveling all over the world. But, you know, as is always the case with uh, people who have had a very busy life and then go to one that's pure entertainment, it's only fun for a while. And eventually you start thinking about business again. So I started my media company and uh, so one thing led to another and here I am in crypto space now. Wow. Okay. But then, I mean, obviously a couple of things here, um, you know, you had a, you had to, I guess, you know, you can define the word for me, but you were in the Caribbean and Antigua for a long time, kind of in this passe with the U S government, correct? Yeah. Well, I was at the same time I was living in Asia. I was still, I was legally resident in Antigua. So I was coming and going back to Antigua as well. So Antigua has been part of my life for 12 years now. And uh, when I had my dispute, dispute with the uh, state of Maryland, which thankfully is over now, um, thankfully, uh, it was actually a dispute that was in the middle of a trade dispute between Antigua and uh, the United States, which was also um, at least to a certain level supported by the Canadian government. So uh, I was able to negotiate with having uh, some sovereign governments behind me and helping me out. And, and I believe that's part of the reason why I was able to get a, a settlement that I could live with. For sure. And let me ask you about that. I mean, the two questions, two part question here. One, I mean, how did it feel? I, I imagine it was pretty stressful. Um, were there any like, you know, do you feel any threats to your well-being is the first question. And then second, I always see U.S. as kind of the big brother. You know, how much sovereignty do these Caribbean nations have? Uh, depending on what it is, probably none. But uh, for something like a trade dispute uh, that was based on uh, online gaming, for want of a better way to describe it, uh, it, it just never rose to the level where it was important enough that I felt like I was a, a, in any type of a personal threat. It was always handled uh, professionally by both sides, and so I, I. But I, you know, if it would have been something more serious, yeah, I don't think I would have been safe uh, sitting on an island in the Caribbean. For sure. And are you only a resident of Antigua? Oh, well, I'm a citizen here, actually. I'm actually citizen, yeah. more than that. I'm actually an ambassador. I'm a diplomat, Antiguan diplomat now. I've been a citizen for a number of years. I've been resident here for and living here, a tax resident, uh, for about 12 years now. And the last few, I've been a citizen through the Immigration Act, not the CIP program. So I got uh, mine just from living here for that long. Gotcha. Okay. So... Um, you know, full citizen of Antigua. You're not a citizen of any other countries. No, uh, no other passports. Canada, Canada yeah. as well. Gotcha. Canada, my birth country. Yeah. Gotcha. The million or, or billion dollar question. You know, how did you discover Bitcoin? About 2010, shortly after it came out, somebody came to me and I was doing some tech investing on the side in addition to uh, being retired, I guess, but uh, still investing. Um, someone came to me and... Uh, had an idea about using this open source uh, blockchain technology for some kind of a, a remittance platform. Uh, the business never really got off the ground, but I did invest some money in it and that was the education cycle. And after that I, I was paying attention to it and slowly educating myself. And I really had an epiphany when I was exposed to uh, Dr. Craig Wright the first time in 2015. And he's the guy that really connected the dots of how the industry worked and uh, ultimately introduced me to a lot of other very smart people, including, I guess, uh, Roger Ver, indirectly. And uh, now I'm surrounded by a bunch of people that know this, this space a lot better than I do, and I'm happy to be a part of it. Wow, okay, so you mentioned Craig Wright, right? And he's been in since the very beginning. I think it's fair to say most people, they kind of hear about it, and then it, it can take a couple of years for it to really click. What did, um, I mean, what did Craig Wright show you that, that helped you click, say, hey, this Bitcoin is for real? Craig just uh, had the, the domain knowledge in his head that not too many other people did. And because there was just so much misinformation out on the internet, trying to figure it out for yourself is actually a challenge. I mean, it's even a challenge today if, if you just go start on your own with all the misinformation that's all out, out there. 
uh, Craig was able to just sort of walk me through it all and explain how all the pieces worked. And in particular, what uh, since I'm more of a businessman than I am a technologist, uh, what Craig was able to do is, is explain to me the economics behind it. And that, you know, once you sort of get that in your head, it's, you, you can't get rid of it anymore. And I mean, so, what were the uh, economic principles that made you say, wow? Well, the, well, the fact that it's scarce and uh, the fact that it's being designed as a utility token for microtransactions and that its value ultimately comes out of being used, which was something that was uh, walked away from by the uh, people that hijacked the uh, BTC branch of the uh, Bitcoin chain, but uh, is back with BCH. I'm not sure if you noticed the shirt I'm wearing, actually. Yeah, I do. The uh, soccer jersey, right? It's from a... a Air United, uh, Scotland. It's the uh, first team to ever be sponsored by a cryptocurrency, and it's actually, I'm behind it. I've uh, been sponsoring the team for about seven years now, and I just switched it to uh, Bitcoin BCH logo. Gotcha. The, uh, and I, if I'm correct, you like, you know, Calvin Air, your last name is A-Y-R-E, and this is A-Y-R. Did you, did, yes. because of your last name, that you decided to go close enough spelling to, to sponsor the well, team? Well, I'm actually Scottish, and that's a district in the south of Scottish, uh, in Scotland. It's called Ayrshire. And uh, there's some lore in my family that we actually come from there. Oh, so wow. I just went up there and started sponsoring the local football club. And I've had a blast with it ever since. That's cool. And so, wait, so were you born in Scottish, or did you just have Scottish descent? Scottish descent. I was Scottish. born in Canada. Okay, cool. And... um. Now, so back to the Bitcoin, you mentioned scarce resources. Uh, I'm sure you invested in, you continually and have invested for a long time in a lot of things. Are, are you into gold at all? I, I was a bit into gold, but gold is, you know, I, I don't really trust intermediaries, gold intermediaries where you're buying a certificate and, and that just doesn't really do me very, very good. And physical gold is such a hassle to deal with because of the uh, cost of security and whatnot and transport. So I never really was all that deep into gold. Uh, I really like re real estate. I'd say the two best investments I have right now from a risk perspective uh, is my real estate portfolio and my, uh, my Bitcoin BCH portfolio. Okay. Now, um, in terms of real estate, I'm guessing you're in multiple countries all around the world? Yeah, I have interest in a few different countries, but I have a lot here in Antigua. Cool. And... Um, Okay, so along those lines, in terms of an investment, uh, I'm curious um, because there's different ways to look at Bitcoin Cash versus Bitcoin Core, right? Um, you mentioned the medium exchange. Uh, it seems that that BTC or Bitcoin, they're highly, like, heavily aligned with Wall Street. Some could argue in like the digital gold, um, as you know, positioning themselves as digital gold. Um, Lightning Network aside, uh, how you know how do you think that will play out with Bitcoin Cash in terms of the price of both of these uh, cryptocurrencies? Well, first of all, the, the scientists that I work with and am friends with in this space don't believe that Lightning Network actually can work. Okay. So I don't put much stake in that at all. And if you look at Bitcoin Core, it's basically SegWit technology. And if you look at it, it doesn't have a utility that I can see. And I firmly believe that, that uh, stored value comes out of utility. So something that you're calling a stored value without a utility underlying a utility is basically a Ponzi scheme. So I actually don't understand how anybody that's calls himself smart would think that BTC is worth anything, let alone what it's trading at right now. Interesting. Um, but does gold, I've seen the argument that gold doesn't have that much utility besides, you know, some jewel use cases and you can buy like, you can buy gold cheaper for them than what it can be stored at. Um, and it seems to have maintained value over the years. Um, just a, just I, I playing think, the devil's advocate here. Yeah, yeah no, absolutely. I agree. But I, I think that, uh, I mean, gold was used as a, a medium of exchange, gold coins and whatnot. And so that was a form of utility. And, and why gold was, was good for that is because it didn't, uh, it was, didn't corrode. So you could store it in bags and salty water and it's still, it's still there. It doesn't disappear on you. So it was pretty hard to destroy. Uh, it was relatively rare and uh, could be fashioned in these, these coins. So I think it did have a, a, a utility as a coin. And it, it also had, I believe with a lot of ancient civilizations, um, ornament and spiritual values, which okay. added to what, what, you know, what, what the essence of it. Uh, in modern days, there is some uh, technical applications for gold as well. 
Okay. But I All think right. your question, or really to get it to its core, I actually think uh, Bitcoin Cash, BCH, actually has more utility than gold. For sure. I, I agree. I agree with that. Um, now, and, and so... And so you're like really close with, um, with Craig, Wright. Why do you th like, you know, why, um, why do you think it's, he's so contentious in the media? Like, you know, is, uh, well, Craig's a savant, a first of all, Go ahead. Yeah, Craig's a savant, and, you know, Craig's just not a normal guy. And sure. I mean, he's, he's obviously got, very high IQ. I mean, that's, that's he's got a lot of gifts. Yeah. Amazing range of gifts. In fact, it blows me away. Some of the stuff the guy can do, uh, but nobody's good at everything. And he's just not good at dealing with other people, particularly if he thinks they don't understand him, what he's saying, and then they're arguing with him about stuff that he thinks they don't understand. That just, he can't handle that very well. And I think for the most part, uh, there's only two kinds of people that think Craig isn't the real deal. It's either people that know he's the real deal and are pretending that he's not because what he's doing is a threat to whatever their, they, their mandate is. Right or it's people that legitimately just don't understand what they're talking about. Sure. Anybody smart can see that Craig actually knows a lot about this stuff and has been around for a long time in this space. Totally. No I, one can I, just I can tell you, I, 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 the only time I regret any of my interactions with him is when he's explained something and explained to me what I should do and I didn't do it. Wow. I've, ne I've never regretted following his advice in this space yet. Besides uh, buying a cryptocurrency, are there any Anything you can share that he recommended you to do that you didn't follow? Uh, he, he, um, you might know I've got a sizable mining business now. I only mine Bitcoin BCH. And I started this about a year ago. And uh, three years ago when I first met him, 2015, he told me that I should be in the mining business. And I ignored it for two years. Uh, That's yeah. my biggest regret since I met the guy. You make a good point because... Um, and Craig Wright doesn't look like a coder. He's like, you know, he's like a good looking guy. He's not, he doesn't look like a, a coding person, someone like Vitalik, right? But a lot of people that are savants that are incredibly technically gifted, um, they usually don't have the, the social skills. So it would be, uh, you know, it would be a bias to judge the way he handles interacting with people um, to have that discredit his, his technical knowledge. Um, I wouldn't I call Craig a coder. He can code, but yeah. that's not what he's good at. He, what Craig's good at combining a bunch of different disciplines. He's really, he's, he's more of a mathematician okay. than he's a coder. But what his real skill is, is that he's way above average at a whole bunch of disciplines. And he packages them together in unique ways. That's what his real gift is. Okay, so he's and got that, like this skill stack. And, and yeah, and, and he's, he gets in a lot of fights with developers who are really good developers, better than him, but actually don't understand some other area of the technology that, because this technology was designed to be used by humans. And it's, there's a lot of human psychology involved in what makes this thing work. And a lot of the developers, right as they are, actually don't get some of these nuances that are involved in this that he does. And he finds that very frustrating to deal with them because they're shooting down his arguments, trying to fall back to their areas of uh, domain knowledge, which is the, the you know core technology side of it. And they're sort of ignoring pieces that he sees as, as important to make this all actually work. That's fascinating. So they have, so these, you know, also intelligent coders are domain dependent, right? And so they're, they're only, you know, looking through one set of eyes where, where Craig kind of, you know, has this skill stack where he can see it from a, a business side, from the math side, um, you know, what, what the world needs, et cetera. And so he has a much more um, well-rounded uh, point of view. And so, yeah. so it probably makes it very difficult if someone's only looking at it from a coding perspective, uh, yep. yeah, these yeah. conversations. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And Craig, you know, the, Craig's not, his, his brain isn't the same as most normal, what I'd call normal people. And so, you know, he just does things to Craig's the way Craig does things. <laughs> it's kind of sure. like marches to his own drummer and that sure. rubs some people wrong. Yeah. And listen, Calvin, I mean, listen, I mean, you're a, you're a savant in your own right. I mean, your, your contributions to the gaming industry and, you know, most of us, you know, myself included, watching, listening, interviewing, you know, I mean, what, uh, what's your skill stack? I think we're all be curious to know. Well, I, I think I would call myself more of a people person, certainly than Craig, but uh, yeah, I'm, I, I, I sit in a space that, that he does, but slightly different. I, I connect dots with different uh, disciplines as well. Uh, I certainly can't go as deep into 
some of them as Craig can do, though. I mean, he's a very gifted guy. But I, I would say that I, I'm similar. I, I'm definitely a better communicator, and I can put myself in other people's shoes better than Craig can, though. But, uh, yeah. But, yeah, I'd say my, my big skill set is just connecting dots, too. But in this particular case, I needed Craig's domain knowledge to be able to connect the dots in my head properly. I, I wasn't seeing it properly until he filled in a few gaps for me. Okay. Makes sense. Makes sense when it comes to Bitcoin. But I mean, so, I mean, gambling, you've mentioned I, the, the gaming industry. Um, it, you, it's been a huge part of your life. Um, where does, um, where does Bitcoin come in or, you know, other cryptocurrencies? It doesn't have to be just Bitcoin cash um, into online gaming, you know, online, the gaming, online gambling. Oh, I think absolutely that Bitcoin was made in heaven for the online gaming industry, not only gambling, but gaming itself. I mean, I, I think that you're going to see a lot more embedded crypto into gaming space, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, you know, as well as I do, because you're involved in the space, that the number of things that can be done with this technology and the ways that it can help people is really, really amazing. And, I like just in general being involved in new territory. I was there right at the start of the online gaming space. I wasn't there right at the start of this space, but I feel like I'm sort of here, here at the start of the second run of this space after the hijacking that happened with BTC and BCH as it was originally intended, Bitcoin, which is now BCH, as it was originally intended to be used, is kind of starting over again and having to... In some ways, it's easier because the concept of crypto is much more mainstream. But in some ways, it's it's harder because the there's so many altcoins out there and there's so many scammers out there that it's actually like swimming against a tide of people that have been either lost money themselves or know somebody that lost money from one of these scams. And you've got to try and convince them. I, I had a meeting this morning with the prime minister of Antigua, who I, I'm involved in a few projects with and I consider a friend. And he just asked me, he said, well, what's the difference between, you know, because we were talking about a scam that came up uh, yesterday that, that's got Antigua's name on it. And somebody was saying that they were involved in Antigua, but they weren't. So it's, that, in that respect, it's a good thing. But it's bad that, that Antigua's name's got dragged into it. But the prime minister says to me, he said, well, what's, what's the difference between these altcoins that you always call as scams and Bitcoin? And, and, you know, I know the difference, but it's hard to explain it to people that aren't in the yeah. space. What's the difference, right? And that's what we're, we're dealing with. And it's going to be a long, hard slug now. Uh, it could have been easier. And I've listened to a lot of Roger Ver's speeches from his early days in the business. And I think it could have been a lot easier if the core people wouldn't have hijacked it for their own personal, uh, theoretical personal gain, taking it off and trying to t move the value to the side chains and whatnot. Uh, it possibly could have been e easier. But now we are where we are right here. And it, like I said, it, to me, it feels like I'm at the start again. <laughs> it's like the second start. Wow. Uh, a couple of things there. All right. So, um, you had a meeting this morning. You're, you're, okay. You're the, what the, the special envoy and like diplomat to Antigua for, for Bitcoin and other things. Sure. How did you, pretty sweet gig. How did you, uh, how did you <laughs> that? well, uh, I've been here in Antigua uh, for 12 years. The last five I've been here a lot. And, uh, I've just been, uh, you know, working on my projects here, and uh, I would go to the government for things that I thought that they needed to change in order for Antigua to be more competitive. If I'm living here, I'm gonna, my natural inclination is going to be to try and you know, help make it better here. Uh, so I just got involved in things. And uh, one of the things I was trying to do was make it more crypto friendly. So I just kept pushing and pushing and educating people. And uh, I've gotten to a point now, and thankfully the prime minister is an ex-banker. So he actually sort of has an ear for this stuff. And uh, I've got to the point where they are quite pro crypto right now. And uh, they want the industry here. And I'm the guy on the ground here that knows it better than anybody that's here in Antigua. So they asked me if I'd help them. So I said, sure. I'm actually working with the government right now and drafting um, some new crypto friendly rules and laws which of course are going to have to be a little bit more complicated because uh, uh, T is part of the uh, economic uh, community or the uh, uh, Caribbean community. So they, they, they can't unilaterally do everything, but they can do a lot of stuff here, especially for their offshore sector, which is a big part of the economy. And that's where I'm actually focusing right now. Interesting because offshore banking, uh, you know, we've covered this on news.bitcoin.com. It seems that that cryptocurrencies are a huge either threat or, 
complement, depending on the way you look at it, to, to offshore banking. They've got a problem down here, though, in this region. And it's a problem all over the world, but it's particularly a problem for these microstates like Antigua. And that's the correspondent banking relationship. And what's happening right now is a de-risking movement emanating out of the United States financial sector, where banks are uh, dropping correspondent relationships with small banks in these countries to reduce their risk according to some formula, but that's just cutting off you know, a whole bunch of people from even, even having access. And even governments down here can't move their own money around in that system anymore. It's really become oppressive. So what I've done in the last year since BCH, uh, since Bitcoin came back, back in the form of BCH, is I've actually taken the majority of my assets other than real estate and converted it all to, into the BCH blockchain and I force everybody that I'm doing business with, this is the story I was telling you about. I force everybody that I'm doing business with to accept BCH in order to do business with me. And I operate almost entirely in a BCH world right now. Wow. I almost don't use the banking system at all. And I'm ask, actually showing that to the government here, telling, trying to tell them, but of course they're risk averse and they're worried about uh, their, the, the, the currency, the volatility of the, of the tokens and all that kind of stuff. So it's a slow slug. Uh, for me to get them in there, but I have gotten them to the point where they're uh, formalizing that they're going to be accepting Bitcoin cash for their, probably some others as well, but I'm told them that's the only one they need. Uh, but they don't do everything I tell them, <laughs> but uh, they do listen to me, but uh, you know, of course they have their own thoughts as well. Uh, but they want to uh, accept that for the CIP program. Uh, I'm selling CIP units right now directly. And sorry, uh, can you define what the CIP program yeah, is? Citizen by investment program. Gotcha. So you can buy a, a citizenship in Antigua for X amount of money. It's $100,000 right now, and then, then, then fees on top of that. Uh, I'm selling them using BCH, but then I'm doing the currency swap, so they're getting fiat, so they're, they're not getting risk. But I'm actually slowly trying to get them used to the concept that I, I'm recommending that they should actually be taking a position in BCH. They should actually have some in their treasury. Wow. That's what I'm trying to talk them into. So, you know, this is, okay, I had heard people talk about this as more as a future type thing, but this is what you're doing right now. The idea yeah. of going to these micro states, these smaller countries where you have, uh, you know, I'm sure you have a lot of cryptocurrency and you can say, hey, listen, I can, you know, mutual benefit. I can help you guys get into this game. Um, but you also um, play a role in, in these, these countries and you're helping other people find sovereignty in, in Antigua. So it's, it's pretty cool to, I mean, I bet 30 years ago, you probably wouldn't think that you'd be able to do that. You know, it's exciting. No. Stuff. Well, actually, 10 months ago, I wouldn't have believed I could live the way I'm living right now. I'll tell you, my life has improved in the last 10 months since Bitcoin came back and with the small fees and everything. And so it caused me to look again at how I could use it in my own life. And I went all in because I was already involved heavily, but I just said to hell with it. I'm transferring everything onto the BCH chain now that it exists and just forced everybody to operate on that. And it's, my life is, it, there was a little bit of uh, discomfort for a couple months, but honestly, we've developed even our own treasury management software that we use to manage uh, BCH treasury because we want to you know, split it all up and, and we want multi-sig and all that kind of stuff for security. So we're, we're getting quite sophisticated at it now. When you say we, are you talking about your company or Antigua? My, my family office that just runs my family affairs. It's based in Antigua here. Okay, wow. So I am pushing this into Antigua slowly, but you know, it's at their speed. Step by step. Now this, yeah. okay, we talked about the you know, US being big brother and sometimes the lack of sovereignty um, in the Caribbean. I, I don't know if it was you, but I've seen people talk about saying, hey, the Caribbean is gonna be a place where, where cryptocurrency is gonna be, it's gonna be the first place where you see cryptocurrency in full blown use. Uh, do you agree with that statement? And if so, why? I think that there's a number of places that it could take off. I think Africa, the whole continent is ripe for um, a cryptocurrency like BCH, Bitcoin BCH. I think the Caribbean, yes, as well. I mean, there's a number of, at my conference in Hong Kong uh, a few weeks back, there was a few people that were talking about do point of sale and wallet applications that are coming out. And uh, the one in particular sent me in South Africa, which is being aimed at the market, not only in South Africa, but in countries in Africa, like Zimbabwe and whatnot, uh, neighboring countries. That technology would work great here in Antigua. And I'm working on a resort here that I intend to 
I, I could fund it myself, but I intend to, to do a uh, security token on top of, top of the BCH chain. I'm working with a development company in Australia right now to actually customize this for me. Uh, the Prime Minister has signed off on a, in our conversation actually just this morning. In fact, he wants one for himself. He wants a copy of the code wow. to uh, do, do another project, do, do it the same way as what I'm proposing here. So that this resort is going to be, it's going to be funded on the BCH chain. It's going to be BCH online to do your bookings. It's going to be have a probably the Scent B technology or something like it at point of sale, so you can use BCH throughout the whole resort. Wow, um, and that's what I'm working on, sort of on the side here. That's almost like a hobby. It's my sort of my main thing. Wow. Okay. And so, so okay. Interesting stuff here. So two follow-up questions. One is you said your life got a lot better 10 months ago. Uh, How did it get better? Um, Because the banking system is dysfunctional. It's not designed to make your life good. Simple transfers for legitimate, legitimate purposes sometimes could take up to two weeks in documents and thousands of dollars in legal fees. Wow. Now I, I, it's like the more money, more problems thing. Sorry to interrupt here, but I feel, I feel like there's a more money, more problems thing going on. People think, say, Hey, I want to be rich. I want to be a billionaire. But uh, manage the, managing your money is a, is a lot of work, right? I'm, I'm Especially in the money. banking system. It's a huge headache. Yeah. But now that I've switched over to BCH, transactions, you know, we're talking a few minutes. Wow. Versus, you know, and free, essentially free. That's cool. And now, now uh, Calvin, I'm, I'm curious because you mentioned the resort. I mean, you're the envoy to Antigua. Um, you, know, you have calvinair.com you can have like the media site around the the gaming industry um you're into bitcoin cash uh any other cool projects you have going on uh that's the main stuff that's public right now i, I do have a venture capital arm and so i have been doing uh, some investing but that's all private at the moment and i've got a few other projects that i'm working on right now but those are not for public consumption yet as well but i i can say that i'm quite confident that you're going to Hear some interesting stories come out of uh, my media sources about some of my projects over the next 12 months. Exciting. Well, we'll keep us posted. I mean, okay, so listen, I mean, speaking of interesting, uh, a, a, a tweet the other day, um, you know, quote, so funny, I know the entire story of the creation of Bitcoin and we'll put a book out eventually. Gavin uh, and listeners who are not aware, a Bitcoin cash developer, Gavin Andreessen, there was some type of kind of prose um, linguistic analysis of his writing. Um, and they said he was Satoshi and he denied it, but, uh, you know, the entire story. He, is he's, not, he's not, he's not, not. he's not, uh, I know he's not, he's yeah, not, I do know the story. Okay. I can't, I'm confident that I know the whole story. And is that going to come out in a book within the next 12 months? Uh, not necessarily 12 months, but at some point, uh, I am going to put a book out about it. If, if someone else doesn't first, I'm not, uh, I'm not the only one that knows what happened. How, wow. how, happened. how many people do you think? know, uh, more or less. I think a lot, but for their own reasons, nobody's sharing it at the moment. Gotcha. Now, a question for you. Is and it wasn't any- one person. Satoshi Nakamoto was, was, was not one person. I'll, I'll tell you that much. There was okay. one more. Yeah. Okay. That, well, that's, that's uh, good to know because I had a question based on him being one person. Like, if it's one person, is there any danger for that person? But it's, okay. It's, it's more than one person. Got yeah, it. There was okay. more than one person involved. Yeah. Um, interesting. And, uh, and, and, yeah, I mean, Calvin, what a – Okay, what are your typical days like? I mean, you have so many things going on. I do because uh, I've got to that age in my life that I have to take care of myself. So I have a regime that starts early in the morning, emails, because I'm dealing with people all over the planet that a break every day at 10 o'clock, we go and get some exercise. Back to the emails, then lunch. Then uh, usually I do my meetings in the afternoon or telephone calls. And uh, then I like to have some fun in the evenings. So, yeah. <laughs> and I like to slip with some water sports in the afternoon once in a while, too. Yeah, I've seen that on Twitter. I mean, so, I mean you're, you're very open about it. You have, live like a very lavish uh, <laughs> lifestyle, uh, do a lot of cool things. What's one thing that someone, because everyone says, right, they, you know, like, I want to be like a billionaire. I want to be a really big time entrepreneur. What's one thing that um, most of us don't know that, that um, is part of that lifestyle? Ah, uh, I think probably most people know this, but I'd have to say that the money doesn't liberate you so much as living in a country that allows you to be free. So you can have as much money as you want and you could still be 
tangled up in a web in a country like Canada or the United States where, where I come from. And you come down to a country like Antigua where there's very thin rules about anything. They don't have the infrastructure to have lots of rules about stuff. And the philosophy down here is to just sort of let people do what they want to do. And so I, I feel that as much as, you know, you hear on the news about all the freedoms in the developing world, in the developed world, I feel much freer in a place like Antigua. And for me, the, the freedom that I get from Antigua is as important as anything else that's happening in my life right now. Very interesting. So it's, um, I've seen that. I, I know a business coach who told me she has clients that are in, in, involved in Wall Street in New York. And it's, it's like, uh, despite having that much money, they still are prisoned by this constant low to mid-range stress and anxiety at all times of the day. Yeah, exactly. And um, so speaking of that, you know, just lifestyle and stress, um, you mentioned that Buddhism is a, like, uh, it's a religion that you appreciate. Yeah, like and how has it affected your life? Well, I live part-time uh, over the last 10 years in uh, two Buddhist countries, Vietnam and Thailand. And uh, I just find Buddhism to be very peaceful. I, I like the fact that it, it doesn't have a deity, that it's basically a philosophy of life. And, uh, yeah, I just think that there's uh, too, too much violence associated with other religions in today's world. People should just chill. Okay, so just chill. Okay, and, and so, Calvin, you're like, what, like 57 or so, and, yeah. uh, and what, like, Four or five years ago, I mean, you knew about Bitcoin in 2012, but it really took till 2015, Craig Wright, so you really got involved, right? I and actually first heard about it probably in 11. 2011, okay. Yeah. Um, because I did that one in remittance investment, but which it didn't really fly. Well, that's sort of why, but I didn't really dig into it lots then. But really, my eyes got opened when uh, I met Craig in Vancouver in 2015, June 2015. He, he was traveling with uh, another Australian guy, a, a mutual acquaintance of ours. And he was introduced to me and, you know, sitting down over some wine. And, and that was really the, the eye opener when I was able to really sort of get a deeper understanding of what it was and, and what it was designed to do and what it could do. Cool. And, and so I guess my point there was just that you, know, you this only a couple of years ago that this really uh, came into full force for you. And now you're, you know, and you're full center of Bitcoin cash. You're one of the faces of, Bitcoin Cash and you're the diplomat or the envoy for, for a country. I mean, it's pretty amazing. Um, and always a difficult question, but I like to ask people this, you know, where do you see, um, you know, Bitcoin Cash five years from now? And where do you see yourself five years from now? <laughs> well, hopefully I'm not working as hard as I, in five years from now as I am right now, but uh, um, I, I'd like to be spending uh, more time in this uh, wellness retreat with this BCH enabled wellness retreat that I'm building here. It's the model of what I hope could be a, a number of them in various locations in the world, but this is definitely going to be the first one. So I kind of see myself getting into that mold more so than being a hardcore tech investor, which is sort of what I've been doing more recently. Um, as for BCH, all of my information and all of what I'm being told by the scientists that I deal with, including Craig Wright, but, uh, but also a number of others, <clears throat> including Amory of B B uh, Bitcoin ABC and, and others, Mocad, um, Joannis, uh, they all believe that, that the BCH platform, which is the original Bitcoin, is a superior technology to be used for micropayments. And they also believe that Anything else that any of the other change, chains do can be done as good or better on this platform as well. And they also all believe, as do I, that there's no need for more than two global payment platforms. So I think sometime over the next five years, unless something comes up that I'm not seeing at all right now, nor is, are the people that I'm talking to, uh, the logical evolution would be towards having one global payment platform, just like there's one global internet, just like there was one uh, fax machine protocol. So I think BCH uh, w can be the dominant platform. Wow. Um, and uh, well, cool. Well, well, Kevin, I really appreciate you, you coming on today. Is there anything, uh, you know, you don't do so many interviews, right? I mean, is there anything you'd like to share to people listening uh, things you've learned about the world, things about yourself that you'd like people to hear? 
um, yeah, just pursue things that make you happy. You're never going to be happy chasing money uh, by doing working on projects that you don't intrinsically like and enjoy. Cool. All right. Well, uh, Calvin, uh, thanks so much and, and hope to have you back a year from now, which is like, as you know, in the cryptocurrency world, it's like 10 years. Uh, so <laughs> exactly. We'll see what's up in 2019. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, Cheers.